and now about our author, who all of you know, obviously. Uh, but I suspect I'm not alone in having been introduced to Heather Cox Richardson during the height of the impeachment inquiry, the first one, uh, <laughs> four years ago. Let's say, how many have there been? Um, well, two that counted in my book. Um, and I suspect that if you're like me, once you started diving into letters from an American, it became daily required reading. Today, Heather's newsletter has grown to more than two million subscribers. Pretty amazing. Her synthesis of history and contemporary politics, always delivered in calm, lucid, and deliberate prose, has provided a touchstone of sanity in what feels like an increasingly unhinged moment. Except on the rare occasions when she takes a day off, which isn't that often, uh, and even on those days, I think you're all aware, she rewards all of us who read faithfully with those beautiful photos of her gorgeous environs in Maine, so we kind of get a bonus. Uh, but except on those days, we turn to Heather for her daily insights, moral clarity, and galvanizing energy. Professor of history at Boston College and the author of a half dozen previous books about 19th century America, Heather helps us make sense of complex and befuddling events as they're unfolding, illuminating for readers the historical trends that shape our current reality. Her new book, Democracy Awakening, explores how radical minorities have used the power of language and the power of their own historical myths to deny the principles on which the United States was founded and how these forces have pushed the nation toward authoritarianism. It's a pretty depressing subject. But Heather's message remains optimistic. She reminds us in her book that American democracy has persisted for several centuries despite persistent attempts to undermine it. And we're delighted and honored that in conversation with Heather tonight will be Jane Mayer, an old friend of Brad's and mine, and an old friend and dear friend of politics and prose. Jane is one of the nation's leading journalists and has won so many prizes that it would literally take the rest of the hour for me to recite them. A longtime staff writer at The New Yorker and author of best-selling books, Jane's reporting has uncovered the truths, especially in her books, behind dark political money, the war on terror, the Clarence Thomas hearings, and the Iran-Contra affair. Today, in addition to working on another book and writing for the magazine, she and her colleagues at The New Yorker, Susan Glasner, Glasser and Evan Thomas, are, uh, have a new podcast called The Political Scene. It's really great. If you haven't heard it, I recommend it highly. Thanks to Heather and to Jane for being here with all of us tonight. Please join me in welcoming Heather Cox Richardson and Jane Mayer. That is quite a welcome. Thank you so much. Um, it's great. It's a great honor to share this stage with Heather Cox Richardson, um, somebody who somehow manages to be a writing success without in a social media star without clickbait. Um, somebody who somehow doesn't talk down to your audience, but actually um, tries to meet them I think you've said at some point that you wanted them to come away smarter than when they opened, started reading you, which I found to be a great sort of contrast to the recent, I'm sorry to sound partisan, but Republican presidential debate where, um, <laughs> where Nikki Haley turned to Vivek Ramaswamy and said, every time I hear you talk, I feel dumber. Um, <laughs> well, the great thing about Heather Cox Richardson is every time you read her, you feel smarter. So thank you so much for being here with us tonight. Well, well, I will say back to that, that when I write, I'm really just trying to figure it out for myself as well. So, you know, I think people say that I, I don't talk down to them, but that's because I'm like, wait a minute, who was he again? And, and wait a minute, how does this work exactly? I've actually started tonight's letter and spent a lot of time going, wait, wait, how does that vote work? So it's a question of not talking down to myself as well, I think. <laughs> but I just have to say, I, I told um, Jane in the, in the back room that I have two subscriptions to The New Yorker. 
because two identical ones because I need to read her so badly <laughs> that one night I was trying to write and I couldn't remember my stupid password and so I bought a second <laughs> subscription. <laughs> and so, so every day when I get the notifications from the New Yorker, they're all double. And I think <laughs> I've got to cancel that other subscription. So it's such an honor to be here with somebody who has such a clear eye about American politics and especially about American money in the courts these days. Well, so th this is a you. treat for, for, I think, all of us tonight. You're, thank you. You're, you're making up for my subscription because mine ran out. Um, <laughs> I'll get you one. <laughs> so, um, all right, the first question has to be, I think, one that's on everybody's mind who reads you, and it's a little bit personal, but I have to ask, do you sleep, and do you, or do you have some kind of no-dose potion that you could share with us at this point. How do you so, manage So you know to what's this funny out? about this is, you know what my nickname was as a kid? Was Lounge Lizard. Because <laughs> I was so damn lazy. And, um, and I do sleep, I don't sleep nearly as much as I should. I will tell you um, that you do learn to catnap in odd places. And I do often fall asleep at my desk. But I do try generally to get six hours in a 24-hour period. Now, as soon as the letters are done, and they will end as everything must, I'm just going to eat M&Ms and kayak and sleep <laughs> and maybe read a book occasionally. But I'm a little short on sleep, it's true. But you must read an incredible amount. I mean, how, do you read online? I mean, how do you take in and digest so much news and then make sense out of it so quickly? Do you have any help? So the, the, the way this works is that I wake up in the morning and I read the news for probably an hour and a half, um, just going through social media and seeing the stories that are out there because they do have patterns, the stories. And then I have my day job and I do that. But, you know, I watch the news and see what comes in and sometimes it sparks other ideas. And in that case, I know where to look because that's what I've been trained to do is do research. People send me tips, they send me material that I would not necessarily otherwise see, and often I look into that, sometimes, actually a lot, often it's duplicates of stuff I've already seen. And then I try from about between three and five to get repetitive exercise, because I find that repetitive exercise, kayaking or walking, uh, helps clarify my thoughts. And that's when I see the pictures. So. If I, can do, if I can't do that, I gotta do it through writing and it takes forever. But if I can do that, then I know the story by the end of the day. Then I start writing whenever I can, usually sometime between seven and nine, which by the way started during the Trump administration and it was my husband who pointed out that the Trump administration dropped news after Sean Hannity went off the air which I didn't notice, and, but it's really true. The breaking news in the Trump administration was after 10 o'clock at night. Um, and, and the night that, the, you, you all were probably asleep, but the night that Trump announced that he had COVID, he announced it at about 11.58. And I was like, dude, that was so not fair. Like if you, because my cutoff is 12 Eastern time. If it was 12.01, I was good for the night. But as it was, of course, I had to take that on because I'm trying to keep a record that is date specific going forward. So then I start writing and then um, I have two readers who have been with me for almost the full amount of time, one of whom has a brilliant eye for quality. She will say to me, this is good and or, and I'm sorry, she will say, this sucks, go back and rewrite it. And I listen to her because I don't have an eye for that. She's fabulous. And the reason I drag that out to some degree is because I have the best copy editor, not just in America, not just in the world, but in the entire freaking universe. <laughs> and she is here tonight. So she is, um, her name is Katja Partan. Wait, um, where is she? She's going to be embarrassed, I think. Okay. Is oh, she over wow. there? She's hiding over there. <laughs> um, she is... <laughs> and she also copy edited this book, except all the errors are mine, or the other copy editor. And so, Katja, so you know how you talk about me being up until 4 o'clock and all that? Katja's up until 4.05. Every single 
night. She has taken zero nights off. And she's the one who puts the commas in the right place and makes sure the word choices are okay and all that. So one of the things I think this represents is that it is not me writing these letters. It is a community of people who are keeping the record for the United States and working together to recreate a new version of American democracy. So I'm so pleased to be here and to have her here tonight. So um, as we come together tonight, we're obviously at a very fraught moment. Um, and also it feels like a very fragile moment for democracy. And I just wonder from your long view as an American historian, um, do you feel we are closer to the brink than we've been before in terms of um, domestic threats to the survival of our constitutional democracy? Yes. I do. I do. I do. And you know what's different? We've had challenges all along. We, we always have. There is no happy moment when the day was perfect or when the country was perfect. You know, August 13th, 1923 or something. We didn't have a perfect past ever. But what we have now that has not been replicated since 19, 1850, I'm sorry, since the 1850s, is that one of our major political parties has been taken over by a group of people who are actively trying to destroy our democracy. And that is unique. We're in a unique moment, but we are also seeing a backlash to that, people trying to take their country back. So we are indeed at a fragile moment, but it is not a moment for despair so much as a moment to recognize we're on a knife edge and to be willing to embrace the creativity and the joy that will come with rebuilding that democracy as we have done in the past. Well, you write in the book that um, during the period building up to World War II, that the world saw the rise of Hitler and the spread of fascism, and that to kind of, the, to kind of an astonishing degree, America resisted these forces unlike so many other parts of the world, and that instead we fought for democracy and basically won and became sort of a beacon for it. But you have some theories in the book about why America was able to resist falling toward for fascism and authoritarianism then. I'm wondering, what, what did we have then that seems to be ebbing now? So this is a great question. You know, why didn't the United States go full fascist in the early 1930s the way so many countries did? Because we were not immune from that. Remember that on Washington's birthday before World War II, there's a party for him in Madison Square Garden with Washington flanked by swastikas and they filled Madison Square Garden to support the idea of America's Nazi past, right? And it seems like it should have been such a short step from that to what so many countries like Italy or Germany ended up doing during that war. So after the war, a number of scholars tried to figure out what it was that made the United States different. And I love this because they, they, they came to a conclusion and they said, you know, Americans are just too practical. They're too moderate. They, they would never do something like that, which is so sweet, isn't it? <laughs> It's wrong, but, but we wish it were right, right? So there was actually a whole school of thought about that, the number of books written about it, about how Americans are just generally in the middle and, and we're good to go. But I think the reason that the United States ultimately did not go down the road of fascism in that period, or communism, um, in that period was because we have, in a sense, had until maybe now, and maybe we still have it now, an inoculation against that. And that is the fact that marginalized Americans have always had in front of them the principles of the Declaration of Independence. So no matter what the conditions were under which they lived, they had a document that declared a set of principles that we all have the right to be treated equally before the law and we all have a right to a say in our government. Both of those articulated by the founders of this country before the framers who put the Constitution together tried to put some version of that, a very different version of that, into law. So it's an old truism that if you have rights, you look at the Constitution. If you don't have rights, you look at the Declaration of Independence. And it is my argument that those 
principles outlined in the Declaration of Independence were a touchstone for marginalized Americans to make sure that the rest of the country, those people who did have rights, could never forget that those were the principles of this country. So that idea, the idea that the principles in the Declaration of Independence were always there for people to say, hey, what about us? meant that when, in fact, we were faced with the idea of losing those ideals to authoritarianism, people knew there was an alternative history, a better history to cling to. Well, I mean, we have the same Constitution and Bill of Rights, but I guess I, I, it, it makes me wonder why so many Americans are flirting with authoritarianism now. Okay, so there's a, there are a number of theories about the rise of authoritarianism in, in, in a bunch of countries. And, Again, after World War II, a lot of scholars spent a great deal of time wondering about why we had a Mussolini and a Hitler. And there's this great thinker uh, who writes a book in 1951. He's a longshoreman in, Sa in San Francisco. His name is Eric Hoffer, and he writes a book called True Believers. And he says, why do we care about Hitler and Mussolini? They're not important. Because every generation has a gazillion people who would like to be, I paraphrase, by the way, who would like to be <laughs> Hitler's and Mussolini's, but they don't get anywhere. What we really need to study is not the leaders. What we need to study is the followers. Why are people willing to follow that? Which I thought was freaking brilliant, really, if you think about it. And what he argued was that you get people willing to follow a strong man when you destabilize a population or a population is destabilized. You know I don't like the passive voice. Um, either economically or religiously or culturally or socially for about a generation. And what that does is it makes them ripe for a straw man to come in and say, you know, you're really unhappy, your fathers were better off than you are, I can bring back a world that you used to enjoy, where you used to be the most important people. Because the only reason you're not important anymore is because of those people. Now, who those people are doesn't matter, so long as you convince your followers that you can return them to a place where they can, for example, make their country great again. And once you've done that, first of all, they start to follow you because you have promised to return them to prominence, but second of all, because you say, I'm the only one who can do it because I know the true rules, whether they are religious or whether they are traditional or whether they are universal. I'm the one who's gonna bring those rules back. And once they have committed to you, it's very difficult to pry them away from that for two reasons. Hannah Arendt talks about, first of all, how you, uh, people internalize that strong man as part of their identity. Hoffer talked about how the more a, a strong man abuses that other, the tighter his people are wedded to him because in order to justify the way they have treated others, they have to believe that those people deserved it because otherwise they have to believe they're the bad people, which is why it's so very difficult to drag those people away from a strong man. Even, you know, Hoffer used to say, the worse they behave, the tighter somebody clings to them. And my comparison is always Narcissa in Harry Potter, when the worst, the worst that Voldemort treats her family, the tighter she clings to him, because of course she's given her entire identity to this man. So if you think about our history, in the last 40 years, what do we see but the concentration of wealth upward, the hollowing out of the middle class, uh, a, a language of othering, you know, we're the good Americans and those people are socialists. We've heard that again and again. They're un-American. They refuse to work. You know, you can fill in all the blanks yourself. And that the idea that the, we could make America great again, which by the way was a, a tagline for Ronald Reagan before it was for, for uh, uh, Donald Trump, only, only by, by silencing those people, either by suppressing their votes, by cutting them out of, of um, the, uh, the body politic. And you know, eventually this goes in, in, in an incredibly dark place. So I think that we have seen in the last 40 years the conditions prepping for the rise of a strong man. And now we are at the stage where we get to decide whether we're going to fight back against that or go down that road. And I, I will say that one of the things that is really important to a strong man is speed. And I think you see that the, the travel ban in January of 2017, I think was an attempt really to create chaos really quickly. And I also think that January 6th was the date 
if January 6th had gone even slightly differently, our country would be very different today. But when people ask me, you know, are we headed for a civil war, my answer is, the reason we got the Civil War in the first place is because the Confederates were able to move really quickly after the election of Lincoln. By December, you actually had South Carolina out of the Union, even before Lincoln took office. It happened very, very quickly. When things slow down and when people get a chance to say, hey, wait a minute, that's not really what I thought we were doing here, you, you often can break that pattern. So the fact that we have slowed down, I think, is a really good sign. That is such an incredible explanation for Trump. <laughs> I wrote a book about it. Uh, that, yeah. <laughs> I recommend it. Um, so, I mean, have we in, in this country seen um, examples before of, of a kind of cult-like um, following that you think, uh, that I think Trump has at this point where, I mean, I think what you explained to me that's very interesting was the people keep saying, and after how many more indictments, how many more trials, why don't they break away from him? And what you're saying is the worst, somehow, in the worse he behaves, the more attached they might be. But have we seen this in, have there been earlier examples? Um, I don't know if it's like Huey Long or, or any, any other sort of cult-like, um, you know, leaders who uh, Americans have followed like this? And if so, how do you break the spell? So, so I can think of three, but they are at the state level. So there's Ignatius Donnelly in the Midwest in the 1890s, and I cannot tell you how much I would love to sit here and tell you about Ignatius Donnelly, because it's information you didn't know you wanted. Um, <laughs> he actually writes a book about Atlantis, uh, saying that Atlantis is real. He's the guy who wrote the introduction to the, uh, the Populist Party platform, in the 1890s, it's actually brilliantly written. He was a novelist, and he ends up becoming so upset about the way politics are going. He writes a novel called Caesar's Column, which you can get on the internet for free. Shockingly, it's not got a large following, um, because Caesar's Column is made up of all the skulls and bones of his enemies. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to lose it there, but I did. Um, he very briefly had a following, and then of course in the 20th century, we have Huey Long, for example, and we have Father Coughlin, both in the 1930s, who looked as if they were going to be able to pull together the kinds of um, followers that Trump did or has, and they fell for, for different reasons, Huey Long because he was assassinated, Father Coughlin for other reasons. But this is the first time we've had that as part of a national political party. This is the first time it's happened at the national level. Now, what we have had before is in the 1850s, we had a similar situation in the American South in which the economic situ situation was such that elite enslavers had essentially taken over the whole region and pushed a lot of poor white farmers off of their land. They become a, 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 roving, a roving group of people really living very marginally and recognize, the leaders recognize that they had to bring those people on board so they really hammer on race from the 1830s going forward. And they also really dramatically curtail the information that is available to white voters in the 1840s, but also especially in the 1850s. And then they, of course, suppress the vote and they kick out of the South the people that don't agree with them. So we do have a, the, the, the conditions in the American South in the 1840s and the 1850s that look very much like where we have been in the 2000 aughts for a certain part of this population. But they did not have a single person to rally around. Jefferson Davis, nobody liked. Um, Alexander Stevens was a crappy speaker. I mean, it was, it was, it, there was like nobody you could really get behind. Maybe Robert E. Lee, but at the beginning of the war, he, he kind of looked like a weenie too. So um, they didn't have that kind of cult following. Well, when you bring up race, it makes me wonder how much um, you think um, that the current uh, rise of, of the, the MAGA movement is intertwined with a backlash against the first African-American president? That's a great question. I, 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 obviously, it's at least part of it, but this has been coming a long time. You know, the, people either argue that Trump is a, a reflection of a long history or that he is unique, and I always whip out my Libra card and say, actually, it's both. Um, but 
Certainly in that particular moment, it was possible to mobilize, for example, the Tea Party and to mobilize all the language that had gone into effect when President Obama was elected. In fact, I wrote a couple books ago, I wrote The History of the Republican Party in part because of all the signs that you saw with people holding up signs saying, you know, we've got a socialist in the White House. And I'm like, really? Is he like the last one in the world? Because, you know, and I wanted to get to why they were arguing that Obama, who was really to the right of Eisenhower, was a socialist. And, um, and, and the answer is that race and class have been deeply entwined in the United States throughout our history, but really certainly since, since the Civil War. So partly it is a reaction to the election of President Obama, but it's also a reaction, I would say, to Brown versus Board of Education, in which the federal government begins to protect the idea that we are going to protect equality before the laws, and then especially a reaction to the Voting Rights Act of 1965, when the United States either had to decide to embrace a multicultural body politic or to reject it. One of the parties embraced it, one of the parties rejected it. It's been a long time coming. I, you know, I was thinking when, how it must have been for you to see on January 6th um, the Confederate flag for the first time inside Congress after you have written a book that's called How the South Won the Civil War. I mean, so, I mean, was this, do you, do you feel that though, that sort of lost cause has never died? It has not died since the Civil War, for sure. And the book, the premise of How the South Won the Civil War was the idea that, you know, the world is basically divided in two between people who think that everybody should be treated equally before the laws and should have a right to say in their government on the one hand, and, be, and on the other hand, people who think that they're better than everybody else and that a very few people have the right and probably the duty to rule over the rest of us. So the premise of how the South won was the idea that that idea that some people are better than others and should rule never really died. Because after the Confederacy, when it should have died, it simply moved into the American West, which had a very similar extractive economy to that of the South, very similar social structures, and there it had found a ready home. So that was the argument there, but I have to say Seeing that flag in the US Capitol was probably the hardest thing I have ever seen in my life. For the simple reason that during the Civil War, Julia Ward Howe came to Washington with her, her husband and her children to, to look at the troops and to see the troops. And she was a, 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 a conflicted woman in a lot of ways because her husband was too old to fight in the war and she felt like she was not able to take on the work that she wanted to to help the war because her children were little. But she was known as a poet and people kept saying to her, do something, do, write something. And so she's out one day with the, the, looking at the troops around the Capitol, and she hears the soldiers singing the song about hanging Jefferson Davis from a sour apple tree, you know, that, which is the, a, famous, a famous song at the time, and that's what they're marching to. So she goes home that night to the hotel, and she wakes up in the middle of the night, and she hears a poem in her head, and she gets out of bed to write it down because she knows she won't remember it, and she doesn't turn the light on, or she doesn't turn up the gas because she's got a kid in the, the room asleep with her. And she writes the Battle Hymn of the Republic. Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. But the second verse of that is, I have seen him in the watchfires of a hundred circling camps. They have builded him an altar in the evening dews and damps. And what she's talking about is these rings of sons and fathers and, and husbands who have built fires around the capital so that nobody could break in, so that the Confederates couldn't come in. And they held those lines for four years, six billion dollars, 600,000 lives. And we had a president who invited that flag into our capital. And when he carried that flag into that capital, I felt outraged not only for us today, but for all those people who had given up so much since the 1860s 
to preserve the idea of the United States as a place where people are created equal and have a right to a say in their government. And I am still mad about it. And that's why I'm in places like this today. You write in your book that false history, the creation of false history as a form of propaganda is a very powerful tool in the rise of sort of dictators and authoritarians. I wondered, did you write this book partly in order to write a true history that you felt people needed to know? Well, you know, what's funny is I began this book simply to be a series of short essays to answer all the questions that people ask me every day. How do the parties switch sides? What is the Southern strategy? What on earth is the Electoral College and why do we have it? And what I found is that quickly I realized I was writing how we got here, where here is, and how we get out. So I wrote 30 short chapters, make up a, they make up a, about 250 pages, and then I put the thing aside for a number of months. And when I picked it back up, I realized it was telling a completely different story than I thought it was going to. And that actually is why it is dedicated to my readers, is that it was clear that there was a conversation going on between me and the people who were writing to me and talking to me that had found a life in a, this book that had very little to do with me at all. And I discovered that, that what, had, what I was writing was how authoritarians overturn democracy using the power of words, which fits into what I study, which is the power of ideas, and crucially, how they undermine democracy by creating false history. And by that, I don't mean just lying about the past, although there's always plenty of that. Authoritarian history to me is the idea that there is a perfect past to which we can go back if only we follow the right rules. And that dictator knows what those rules are, so we all need to trust him. And that past, that perfect past is preserved and we can get it back if only we follow those rules. And of course, as a, as a historian of America, you know that, you know, even before the Puritans set foot in the United States, they were already talking about how good things were before. I mean, we've been complaining about how we're falling apart since the 1600s. There is no perfect past to go back to. And what I figured out was that true American history with small d democratic history is not about a perfect past. It's about the ongoing struggle to try and create a world that represents ordinary people and that makes the lives of the majority of them the best it can be. That is, it creates a government that is good for the most people. It's never perfect and it never will be perfect. It goes forward, it goes back. It is brilliant and it is terrible. And the, the difference between those two things is that in the, the first one, we have no agency. And in the second one, it's all about us. And that, after all, is what this country is all about. So that was not what I set out to write, but that's what my readers told me the book was about. It's a pretty optimistic book in, in that, in the end, at least a third of the book is ideas you've got about how to strengthen democracy. Are you optimistic despite it all? I am. I'm optimistic not only because we have been through terrible times before, um, I, I tell the story sometimes, I wrote a, a piece on the great crash in, uh, in the 20s, and I thought, we all know what happened, you know, it's miserable. So I want to write about something else, so I wrote a piece about the night before the great crash, which was really interesting because I looked through the New York newspapers and it was the opening of the opera, and everybody's wearing their jewels and, you know, going out and hearing some great opera and eating fancy dinners and all that, and there's this little piece, and this one guy has failed in business, and he can't pull his life back together, and that night he dies by suicide. And I read that, and I thought, dude, hang on just one more day, because tomorrow you're going to discover that all those people who are in jewels are worse off than you are. Just hang on one more day. And sometimes that's what I feel like. We don't have to hang on forever. We just have to hang on one more day. So I believe in American democracy, but I also believe in the human project. And that is the idea that the human project to me is a search for 
the right to self-determination. And I don't believe at the end of the day that people, a majority of people, will voluntarily give up their right to determine their own futures. And so I, I do think that we will come out in a good place, but it's going to take a lot of work. It's not guaranteed. And that's sort of the whole point, that it's going to take a lot of work. We know at the end of the day, even if we do get a strong man, that he will fall. They always do. But they do a lot of damage before that happens. So my goal here is to make that period of damage as short or non-existent as is humanly possible. You know, with, with two um, on the edge here of watching two horrific wars, um, one um, in Ukraine and um, Israel and in the Middle East, I wondered, do you, does history give us any kind of guide for how this might affect the 2024 election? Um, do you see the, the support of uh, these two allies being something that may become increasingly divisive? How has it played out in terms of um, the two parties conserv and conservative and liberal politics? How do you think it might affect um, Biden versus Trump? Well, so I'm a prophet of the past, not the future. I always like to say that, because who knows? But I will say, um, you know, one of the real surprises for me out of the past year, so last year everybody was saying to me, what's going to happen in 2024? And then I kept saying, I don't do that, because you never know what's going to happen. And one of the surprises for me out of 2022 was the rise of Volodymyr Zelensky as a world hero. And if, if you ask me the most important sentence of the last 40 or 50 years, I would argue that it is, I don't need a ride, I need ammunition. Because that was huge. And if I get a number two, it is um, Alexander Vindman saying, here, right matters. Because that was the turning point when people started talking about American democracy. Adam Schiff had talked about it before, but in a, in a somewhat oblique way in the first impeachment hearing of 2019. Vindman just stood up and said, I'm okay because here right matters. Of course, then he got fired. Um, but those two things, I think, have begun to enable people to articulate what democracy means. And what the, how that's going to play out going forward, I am really un uneasy about saying anything so early on about the horrific attacks in Israel because by every minute new information is coming out and that new information is already shifting governments through the Middle East and it, it is completely unclear to me what's going to happen. Um, so that's a, a, I guess a long way to say I'm watching all of it really closely um, I'm also following the Institute for the Study of War on both of them, which is a very good website. Three paragraphs every day on what's happening in every, in every conflict around the world. Um, but I, I, I think all bets are off. So one piece we, of... We don't even have a House of Representatives right now. This is true. Which is like, like so what are they going to do? I mean, you're watching that today, and some people are saying, well, I'm not going to do anything without a package that does Israel, but then I have to include Ukraine. Oh, wait a minute, we don't have a speaker. I mean, we're kind of in uncharted waters. Yeah, the, I, I, I am sure that for historians, the same rule applies for journalists, which is be very careful before you use the word unprecedented because there's always someone who can find something to contradict you. No, but, not in the loss but, of a House Speaker during I was going to say, this, how during... unprecedented is the dysfunction in the House right now? And, and, and Well, they're good at dysfunction, I have to say. <laughs> <laughs> but in this particular case, usually they keep their House Speaker. Um, even when they're dysfunctional. So we, we had a, a house in 1879, it was crazy. Um, but they kept their house speaker. Um, so this is, that, that at least is new. The idea that we're trying to reorganize the house in the middle of a term, that is unprecedented. So one other piece of news um, that I wanted to ask you about, and then we'll take these questions that people have uh, have sent over here. But I, you know, I was interested in a, in a in a piece of news that many people may not have seen, but there was a terrific story today um, that was published by ProPublica that is about Leonard Leo, the founder of the Federalist Society. And it basically describes a machine that he built, political machine, 
to take over the courts in America um, on behalf of the conservative legal movement. And I guess I wondered, if you're looking back in history, have the courts been uh, the focus of such political attention in the past? And if so, are there, you know, I mean, is this, is this a new frontier to take that third branch and make it so political? Well, the courts have always been political, for sure. But th this particular court is different in a lot of ways. It does have a precedent. The precedent is um, in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, the Melville Fuller Court, which I find really interesting because it's not called the Melville Fuller Court. It's called the, um, oh, come on. Uh, the case about labor. Robert Barron's court? Oh. <laughs> no. Lochner? Oh, yes, the Lochner. Lochner. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, and it was just, it just did the bidding of big business. It, it's the Plessy v. Ferguson uh, decision, which is the one saying segregation is okay, but it is also a railroad decision, which gives a ton more powers to the railroads. It is the one that says that the, the government has no power to Im, impose an income tax. And then within three months, it said, oh, but it can go after individuals in, in, um, in Ray Debs. It's the one that gave us the insular cases, which said that we were going to have, what is it, foreign lands in a domestic sense, the lands that are foreign in a domestic sense. <laughs> <laughs> meaning we can take all the Pacific Islands without actually making their inhabitants citizens. I mean, it does all kinds of things. So the court has always been political, but this court is different, and I would like to hear what you have to say about Leonard Leo, by the way. It's different, first of all, because um, it is the first court I think we've ever had that doesn't have an elected official on it. That is, there's no law that the people on the Supreme Court have to be judges or even lawyers. And in the past, they've always had an elected official with the idea that that kind of gives them some sense of what's happening in the real world. And I believe Sandra Day O'Connor was our last elected official to sit on the Supreme Court. It's also different because we have modern medicine now, so people live for a very long time, and we have modern... No, no, I'm not kidding. Really, if you think about it, that's one of the key reasons we have such an older governing body is because people are living a lot longer and much healthier lives, and we also have modern transportation. So back in the days when you had to ride a horse around the circuit, for example, or you had to get to Washington on a boat and a railroad and a carriage, people just quit and, and said, I'm done, you know, I'm, I'm 45 or I'm 50, I'm done, I wanna go home and, you know, tend my petunias. They don't do that any longer. So again, you think about the people who used to just simply retire. They're not retiring. The idea that you get carried out toes up from the Supreme Court is a very new idea. So those things are different and they have created a really different opportunity for people to take that court, which if you think about the way our government is set up, the House of Representatives is set up to turn over very quickly, every two years, right? The Senate is set up to turn over much more slowly Every, every, it turns over a third every two years, but every six years for the whole thing to turn over. Presidents in between, every four years. So he can kind of react to the people, but also doesn't, doesn't go with a brush fire the way the House of Representatives do, does. But judges, judges are there as long as they behave with the idea that they will be a break, but they were never intended to be a break that went on for you know, 102 years at a time. <laughs> so what do you think about, about I, all this? I, I think some of the judges are there even after they misbehave. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, I don't know. I, I mean, I've, I have heard, you know, many nostrums and people suggesting things like term limits for the Supreme Court, which is actually a very popular um, position now out in the country. But you've convinced me that horses are actually the way to go. Can you, ima can you imagine if you took our Supreme Court now and you put them all on horseback? <laughs> or or you, you, even if you gave them bicycles and said, it's 35 miles to court, go for it. How many, of, how many resignations do you think you'd have before the sixth mile, right? <laughs> that, I, you've got me for this. I think this is a, you know, a movement that we could launch right here. <laughs> Um, so, okay, taking some questions that have been sent up here. One is a, a, a pretty simple question, but I think interesting to a lot of people probably, which was, what was it like when you were brought in to have your tete-a-tete -tete with Joe Biden? That was so funny. Oh, my God. 
So, so they called me. I, was, it was, I think it was during the pandemic, wasn't it? They called me, and they had asked if I was interested in talking to somebody, and I actually have spent time as an interviewer, and I love hearing people's stories. So the answer to that is virtually always yes. And they called back in a few days and said, are, are you interested in talking to a principal? And I said, sure, that'd be great. And they said, would you like to talk to the president? And I said, that'd be great, the president of what? <laughs> and, and then he told me, and I'm literally shaking. I, I, can, I still remember looking out my front door going, I cannot believe this is happening. <laughs> and we were supposed to go visit my kids on a, on a trip because it was spring, it was February. And, um, but we weren't allowed to tell anybody no, because of security. So we couldn't tell anybody. And I, so, so I'm not telling my kids if I'm coming or not. And they're getting madder and madder and madder at me. And my son finally goes, I, 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 well, screw it. I'm just going to make my own plans. And I hope I get to see you, but I'm just, I'm tired of waiting for you to make plans. And it's killing me. But then the war broke out in Ukraine and I, and, and I assumed that it would be called off. But we decided to go that direction anyway. And, um, and then, of course, it, it went on and it happened. What I thought was really interesting was that the White House, to me, is a historical building. It's all about history. But it's also a modern-day office building. And I was like, you know, get out of my White House when you're talking there about, like, envelopes. Like, this is, this is historical. And, of course, the, the people are running around putting stuff in envelopes, right? Um, he was uh, very knowledgeable really wide range of ability to cover a whole bunch of stuff. And what you didn't see on the tape was I talked a lot about taking over, um, he took over a, a position from Strom Thurmond, as I recall, on the uh, Senate Foreign Relations Committee. And um, the, I mean, he was, he was just absolutely terrific. Um, but, uh, but then we went to leave and they said, you know, we're going to, going to give you all the tape. You can do anything you want with it. And they, they kept emphasizing they could do, we could do anything we want with it. And I said, well, that'd be great. My assistant will get you all that information. And we walk out, and I turn to my wonderful assistant, who's a, a stand-up com comedy guy when he's not working for me. And I said, Nicholas, what people? We don't have any people. Where are we going <laughs> to find people? So we went to a pizza parlor and went through our phones going, do you think he knows anything about cutting video? Do you know, think he knows anything about cutting video? <laughs> and so I finally got a, a friend of mine who's a, a really good sound guy. And I texted him and I said, Michael, do you have a video guy? Because I need a video guy immediately. And he said, well, what do you mean by immediately? Do you mean in a week or do you mean in a month? And I said, I need someone tonight. And he said, oh, I can't get you anyone tonight. And I said, I think it might be worth it to him. And he said, okay, what you got? And I said, an exclusive with the President of the United States. He goes, I'll call you back. <laughs> <laughs> and within, a, within an hour, he had a video guy for me, whom I never actually met, who cut the thing. So it was a wonderful experience, I think, for me, of being able to talk to a historical figure. My historical figures are all on paper. And they're supposed to do what I tell them to. And he actually had ideas about his own career, which I found shocking, because he's not allowed to think that way. But it was, um, it was, I think, both a great, a great example of how immersed he is in history and how much he cares about reaching people, ordinary people, and is going out of his way to do that. And that, I thought, was incredibly impressive. People think I have his ear. I do not. I have no contact with the White House. That was a one-off. But it was a wonderful experience. And I actually texted my kids a picture of myself in the press room they were all so mad at me, they didn't answer. And finally I said, don't you want to know why I'm in the press room? And my, finally one of my kids said, okay, I'll bite. Why are you in the press room? And I said, because I just interviewed the President of the United States. And then all of them jumped on the text and said, okay, is that what you were doing? I'm like, yeah, I wasn't allowed to tell you. So that's the long story. That's very cool. You, you, you write um, often quite positively about Biden, maybe more so than a lot of the... the the uh, political press corps. Do you um, think that he doesn't get enough credit or people don't really understand what he's doing? I think that he is a transformational president. I have said this. And people, I actually use my words extremely carefully. And people often read into that things that are not there. And if, I, if I'm not on solid ground, I won't say something. It's not that I don't have an opinion, but I won't say something unless I know I'm on solid ground. So I've called him a transformational president because no matter what happens, he is the end of the Reagan revolution. 
He is the person who has overturned the idea that markets are the solution to creating a just society, which is, of course, the principle behind the Reagan revolution that really went into effect in the 1980s and really has carried on since then. He has quite explicitly said, this is it. We are getting rid of the monopolies that have been created. We're going to try and get rid of the concentration of wealth upward. We're going to try and use the government to work for ordinary. I mean, he, he's, he's doing all that. He's articulating it. He's saying it. Um, he's also transformational in terms of foreign affairs, in which I really believe he is trying to deal with the problem of the expansion of democracy without colonialism which is a very important intellectual problem, and it's one that I think he is trying to solve by focusing on regionalism and focusing on creating regions around the world that can handle their own problems with the U.S. having a seat at that table, but not being part of a group trying to dictate to others, which is one of the reasons I think that he was so keen on having the African Union join the G20, which is now essentially the G21 because of that, and why he's focusing so clearly on the Indo-Pacific. All that being said, we don't know how that's going to come out. So the question is, why doesn't the press give him that, give him more credit? I think that's two, threefold. One, because since Watergate and our lack of faith, or since Vietnam and our lack of faith in the government, it's not cool to say, "Hey, I like the government." It takes a lot, you know, people seem to think that I do really smart things. It's not that. It's that I dare to see, say things that other people think but don't dare to say. And I dare to say, hey, I really think that's a good policy. That's all I do. So first of all, people don't dare to say things are good. It's way easier to cut people down than it is to build people up. Second, I think that, um, that it is much harder to talk, for example, about... Um, antitrust policy and the roots of antitrust policy in Louis Brandeis, for example, and how that was overturned by, um, by Robert Bork in the 1980s and really doing a deep dive than it is to have a really quick media hit. And one thing about the radical right is they're so easy to cover. They're, they, they, they are made for TV. Nancy Mace from South Carolina yesterday in that Scarlet A t-shirt I mean, and you all know what I'm talking about, right? Because everybody covered it. Who cares, right? <laughs> but in contrast to that, understanding the machinations right now in um, Netanyahu's cabinet, that's really complicated. So I think that's part of the problem. And then I think the third problem is that, four problems maybe, the third problem is that the radical right was very effective in saying that unless you presented both sides equally, you were somehow unbalanced, fair and balanced, right? And that's, of course, not at all the case. We're engaged in looking for what actually happened rather than in, in making everything a horse race. And finally, um, you know, journalists have a really hard job. And we are madly, not we, not you and me, but money in newsrooms is being absolutely slashed. And they simply don't have the time and the money to cover things the way we used to. So one of the things that always jumps out to me is the difference between being interviewed by European journalists and American journalists. Because the American journalists need the story right now because it's coming out tonight. And there are literally a number of journalists I talk to from other European countries who call me just to chat. Not for anything secret, but to say, I don't understand really what's going on in Georgia. And I'm not writing a story about it, but I feel like I need to know it. And you just don't get that from American journalists. They can't afford to. So I think there's a lot of stuff going on. That's sad that, that we're falling behind that way. I mean, and, and dangerous, really, in, in a lot of ways. Um, I, when you mentioned the right wing, I was going to ask, have they come after you? I was just thinking, you're up there in Maine with Tucker Carlson. <laughs> <laughs> not quite with Tucker Carlson, just saying. <laughs> Um, well, so yeah, remember, I got into th to this public stuff because I was on, I was on the first incarnation of the Professor Watch List oh. in November of 2017. So I had a fairly public career. I'd written a bunch of books, and I certainly wrote for all the newspapers. But when, when Charlie Kirk, who's now Talking Points Memo, and now in a great deal of trouble in the last couple of days for apparently simply grifting the money that was given to his organization, um, 
he, I was, I know exactly where he got my name, but, but I was on the, the early professor watch list and I was so angry because there has never, ever, ever, ever been any concern about my teaching. I'm a very popular teacher and I was so offended by that. But, but I didn't really think about it. I came down the stairs that morning in my jammies and I turned, opened my laptop and I was flooded flooded with messages from all around, all my friends, all around the world, Facebook, everything, people saying, we stand behind you. And I thought, well, that's great, but what have I done? And then I, <laughs> then I found out. And so I wrote a message to them telling them not to worry and telling them that I would not shut up, um, which is what people had been concerned about. They were afraid I would stop speaking out. And, um, and I actually said to my kids that I would shut up if they were concerned about our safety. And um, one of my sons said, but mom, if we can't trust you, how can we trust? Who can we trust? So I decided to stay in the game and I wrote this message and I put it on Facebook and it went viral. And that was it. I was in the game and I haven't been able to get out since. Well, I want to thank you for not shutting up and for coming here tonight. So Well, thank you. I, I, I don't have any idea what time it is, and I'm so tired. I have, I, are we good? We're, done. We're good. Well, so, what a cute dog. Oh, thank you. Um, so, I, I actually have something to say. I want to thank Jane for everything that she does. And I am not kidding when I say she... She is the must-read in this country, um, and, and it's such a joy to be here with her. But I also want to add thanks to you all, not only for coming tonight, but because the, this book is really ours. It is not mine. It is part of an ongoing conversation that we have built over the past four years now and counting about what we want for this country. And I thank you so much for teaching me so much, for pushing me so hard, for challenging me, for making me hopeful about the future, but also for being with me on this attempt to keep a record of these incredibly tumultuous times. And as a historian, if you had given me the choice of any position in the world, not that I knew this one existed, keeping the record of these years would have been beyond my wildest dreams. And I, I am aware every day that I am the luckiest woman in the world and that I'm here able to do that because of you all. So thank you for everything you have done for me and, and for this conversation and for the world for the last four years. And let's keep it going.